favorite people. I'm going to start with you, Michael. Um, everybody sees you today on CNBC as a crypto expert, uh, crypto aficionado, but I know you forever as a legendary macro trader before you got into crypto. So let's talk there first. We'll get to Tom in a second. Tell our audience a little bit about where you see the macro environment right now as a current and former macro investor. Yeah, listen, it's, I was talking to one of my friends who's kind of a legendary macro guy had retired. He said, I'm coming back out of retirement um, because the environment's so ripe. We're probably going into what will be three to five years of the golden age of macro. And I say that because for the last 15 years, we've had, you know, this great moderation, low inflation, very low volatility and currencies and interest rates. And all that's changed, right? We now have eight, nine percent inflation. You know, we're going to be in the mid teens in the UK. Um, you've got places like Japan that are keeping rates at zero where the rate, US rates are going to four percent. And so you've got dollar yen that's gone from 110 at the beginning of the year to 145. And I think that's going to continue. And so from an overall perspective of making money in markets, it's a, it's a field day for macro traders. And you're going to see macro funds show up and get bigger. And there are not a lot of people that have the experience, um, right? It became a, a... Yeah, it was out of favor for... Out of favor for a long time. And banks don't allow people to learn to trade macro anymore, right? They've got very tight aisles and lanes where each trader at a bank trades and not a lot of risk capital. And so the training ground to be a speculator has gone away. And so, listen, tomorrow we get the CPI number. If it's low, you're going to see a continued rally in risk assets. Uh, the yield curve should steepen at one point. Um, crypto will do well if you get a low CPI number. The one thing I would caution, though, and I think the CPI will come down, I mean, energy prices have been down for 80 straight days, is where inflation goes really uh, is going to be driven by labor inflation. That's the inflation that the central banks care about. And we've never experienced that in the last 20 years. So this is the first time we've got real labor inflation and inflation expectations driving that. And so to think it's going to follow the model that the last 15 years did, it might be a, a mistake. And so that's really where you got to focus. But I think it's going to make the environment uh, thrilling. So, so, Tom, you were the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, you waded into crypto. You're now the CEO of Bull Bullish. Take us through your odyssey in traditional finance into where you are now. And tell us a little bit about Bullish. So uh, first of all, I just want to say to the audience, it's fun to be up here with these two. Uh, these are, whenever I talk about them, not in their presence. These, these are two of the smarter people that I know in markets generally and in crypto specifically. And I always kind of turn up the TV when, when you guys are talking. So um, I'm not expecting it's to just, win this. It's just you and my mom. That's it. <laughs> Nobody else. My mom doesn't even watch. Yeah. <laughs> but so I, I wanted to start with that. It's great to be up here with, with the two of you. You know, I had this fun job running the New York Stock Exchange. I kind of went trad TradFi all the way, and uh, here I was in this awesome place running the Stock Exchange for five and a half years, got to meet really cool people, and we had won 45 large IPOs and all the tech IPOs and Alibaba and this kind of thing. And I kept peering over the fence at friends who were leaving for crypto or friends I knew who were crypto native, and it, it just looked fun. And so I left, and uh, Turns out it's not always fun, <laughs> but, it's, but it's always interesting. And I remember when I left, you know, people were like, what is he doing? Even my own father sat me down and he was like, you know, did you get caught stealing a ham sandwich from the cafeteria or something? Why are you leaving this job? But I haven't regretted it for a single moment. I, crypto is interesting. Um, but look, part of why I say it isn't fun is for every runaway success, for every Ethereum, there's Terra Luna. And we're going to have to wade through that for a long time. I'm, I'm actually short-term pretty bearish and, and long-term incredibly bullish. And from the outside, you look at digital assets right now, it's like there's a glut of layer ones, there's a glut of block space, there's uh, shenanigans from, from, from people who come in and promise things that can't possibly be true, and there's all those problems. But on the inside, there's brilliant 
kids by and large, building real utility, building real applications. And I think we'll actually look back at this period that at times feels dark, you know, retail's run away and all those problems I mentioned as, as a bit of a golden period for, for entrepreneurs. So I'm thrilled I made the move. One minor correction, you introduced me as the CEO of Bullish. I'm actually the incoming CEO of Bullish. Uh, that transaction is pending uh, SEC approval. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. You agree with Tom? Well, given, given how quick the SEC is, Tom might have gray hair by the time he's the actual CEO. <laughs> I'm, I'm not as pessimistic. Not, not if Tom has my colorist, he won't have any gray <laughs> yeah, hair. Yeah. Anyways, I shouldn't be talking about hair. Yeah, probably shouldn't be um, talking about it given the state of your hairline. I'm not as pessimistic in the short run about crypto. Uh, you know, for a couple reasons. Listen, crypto is always about narrative, um, right? In the 2000. 17 bubble. It was probably 95% narrative and 5% actual product. And in the 21 narrative bubble, it was probably 70% story and 30% product. And I think in this next chapter, it's going to have to be the opposite. It's going to have to be utility. It's going to have to be used for stuff. And people are going to be a little more discerning. But you're um, seeing that, right? Michael? We're starting to see that. Um, but it still needs narrative, and we have narratives, right? In Bitcoin, and all of crypto, but Bitcoin specific, by far the most powerful narrative right now is this constant march of institutional adoption. If you had asked me on Christmas Eve, before I went to sleep waiting for Santa Claus, what I was praying for, what a present I really got, wanted, it was BlackRock putting crypto on Aladdin. <laughs> and they did. And that's not going to be seen in flows probably until the second quarter of next year. But that's a monumental thing. That is the biggest asset manager in the world with the biggest platform for all institutions to participate on, saying we believe in crypto, we're going to let Coinbase on it, we're going to put our own product on it, and mark my words, every other crypto firm like yours and ours will have stuff on Aladdin at one point. Um, and so that's access, right? You saw... Uh, Franklin Templeton getting engaged uh, last week. A bird told me that Fidelity is going to, a little bird in my ear, that Fidelity is going to shift their retail customers into crypto soon enough. Um, I hope that bird is right. Um, and so we're seeing this institutional march, and that gives crypto its, its floor. But you add that to the fact that, you know, the Fed's at getting to 4%. At one point, they're going to hit at least a an equilibrium, the yield curve will steepen, and then all of a sudden people will start getting worried about government spending again in crypto. I think we'll take its next leg up. And so Bitcoin's got a good story, and then just this week we're going to get the merge done. Like when I first bought Ethereum in 2015, they were talking about the merge in 2017. And so five years late, uh, unbelievable technological uh, achievement, uh, give Vitalik and his whole cohort uh, a hand, but it's going to happen. And that's a powerful story because if you think about yeah. a, a decentralized pro project accomplishing something that important, that's a big check mark that decentralized projects can work. Uh, but B, for Ethereum specifically, it shifts the supply dyna demand dynamic a lot, right? You had miners selling every day, now you're gonna have people staking Ethereum for long periods of time. And you're also gonna have less inflation. And so if I learned, I actually learned from Paul Jones in like my first trading lesson, prices are set on the margin, right? And we are shifting the marginal supply demand imbalance in Ethereum pretty dramatically. And so I think they're two bullish stories, and so I'm long. So Thomas, let's say that I'm a uh, institutional investor, I come to see you, and I say, geez, I'm just concerned. I don't really understand the marketplace. I don't really understand what Michael is talking about. Um, but I feel like I need to get into this. What are some of the things that I should be looking for? What's the checklist in your mind uh, that I should be going through before I make an investment in cryptocurrency? Uh, great question. I, I agree with Mike broadly in the sense that, it, in particular with Bitcoin, there's an underpinning of institutional demand that will support Bitcoin for the years, likely decades to come. I'm also a little more sanguine about where we are. I think we're like two pitches into the top of the first inning. I mean, I've spent my whole career 
servicing institutions in financial markets, and I can honestly say I've had fewer than five in the entire time I've been in digital assets approach me, real institutions I'm talking about, the types of names Mike was mentioning, and say, we really want to get into digital assets, Bitcoin or otherwise. So I, I just think we're still really early days, and this weekend I was looking at uh, NVIDIA, unrelated reasons. NVIDIA is a stock, you guys are probably familiar with, a company, semiconductor company. The stock's down 60% since Thanksgiving. That market cap is bigger than all digital assets combined, setting aside Bitcoin and Ethereum, so every single altcoin. So the, the, the first problem, I think, the biggest problem with institutions is that the market is still just too small, and so it requires early adopter type institutions. The second problem is a lack of regulatory clarity that I know we'll get to. But to answer your question directly, Anthony, like, if institutions come to us, the first thing we say is, just be careful who you deal with, because we're still in a cowboy era of intermediaries. I mean, there's so many exchanges all around the world. There need not be, by the way. Uh, there should probably be single digit and fewer than five credible exchanges. But there's exchanges that just outright lie about their activities, uh, that have absolutely no transparency, that trade opposite their customers, that charge exorbitant fees. And the institutions kind of go, oh my gosh, that's a real problem. And, and it is, and sometimes that scares them off. And so I, I try to point them on that path of doing your homework, finding honest counterparties, uh, and there are some out there, it's relatively few, but they are out there, and that's really step, step one. So, so Tom's bringing up the biggest point, I think, in the room, which is about regulation and fairness and customer safety and protection. Um, you and I know Gary Gensler a long time. We both worked with him at Goldman Sachs. You were in Hong Kong with Gary, so you know him pretty, pretty well. Um, where do you think we are? I asked Sam this question earlier. Yeah, listen, it's, we're at a point of frustration. Um, Gary's very smart. He understands crypto and he understands what he's doing. By his actions, he obviously doesn't want to afford crypto right now. Just doesn't. You know, he's got his own so, reasons. So, so is that political? Or I, would, that... I would argue it's probably political, but I don't know. I can't read his mind. I'm just looking at what's happened. Like, there's no reason we should not have had a Bitcoin ETF. And if you just look at that as your North Star from what a regulator, if they cared about forwarding the U.S.'s, you know, potential position in the crypto ecosystem, right? The U.K. is doing one, Brazil's doing one, yeah, Canada's right. doing one. And so it's not like this is such a radical thing. And so he's making a decision to slow roll this thing for whatever reason. Um, that's not great for us, right, as an industry. Uh, it's not the end of the world either. You know, you continue to make slow progress. What has shifted immensely since when he came is Congress's education level, right? In the last nine months, uh, both the left and the right have gotten much more savvy about crypto. They understood that there's 60 million Americans that own crypto and a lot of them are single issue voters and they're donors, right? Sam Bankman Fried here, your, your co-sponsor, it was Biden's biggest donor. Um, good for Sam. Uh, and there are lots of lobbying efforts going on. And so now you've got kind of a two-way street. Um, it's a Republican-dominated issue, but the Democrats are not completely conceding. It's bizarre to me that Elizabeth Warren continues to be, and I think this is the Gensler link, really anti-crypto, because crypto at its core cuts out the middleman. Like, when it's done well, right, the decentralized systems could really enrich creators, artists, actors. What it's all about. Really, why we got into it in lots of ways. And so you're cutting out banks, you're cutting out ATM machines, you're cutting out, like, you know, the royalty takers in lots of ways. So like, but, but right now, that's, that's the stop. So, Tom, let me test something on you. I, I, I know you're not Elizabeth Warren's psychotherapist, but I want you to channel that energy for a second. Uh, she's for the underbanked. Right, supposedly, she's yeah. progressive, she's woke. Uh, uh, cryptocurrencies do all of that, but is it because Mike Novogratz got rich in cryptocurrencies that she's so upset? Give me the psychotherapy behind her decision making and the, and the draw she has for, on Gary Gensler. I have no idea, and for self-preservation reasons, I won't be drawn in in that exact form or fashion. <laughs> but um, but let, me, let, me, let me give as good a devil's advocate view as I can. Number one, there have been a number in the last six months of outright frauds 
that have ruined tens of thousands and probably more lives, financial lives. Um, num number one. Number two, there, there are some issues, and this gets into a much, much bigger topic we could talk about for hours and hours, but there, there are some issues with traceability uh, of digital assets by bad actors, in some cases state actors, where we as an industry haven't yet come together and said, hey, we need privacy, we need decentralization, and we understand that there's a balance between the right to privacy, and I would argue it is a fundamental right, might not be in the actual Constitution, and the ability of government to do its job. Uh, and so when you put those two things together, that is the only argument I could come for somebody who's saying, hey, just put the brakes on digital assets. I don't agree with it, but you put me in a, you put, you put me in a, in a box. The, the one thing I will say to this audience is, don't be afraid of regulation, just kind of writ large. I remember back in 2008, I was managing futures markets before equities markets. The price of oil went to 140, and we at ICE were the bad guys. We were the villains. It was an OTC market. It wasn't heavily regulated. And, 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 and Washington was coming for us, and we were scared to death. As I look back, when that ultimate regulation came in, and in fact took us from OTC to a prudently regulated framework, institutional adoption absolutely took off like a rocket ship. Uh, uh, more inclusive involvement of retail, mass affluent retail, as well as institutions followed. And just as a financial matter, ICE's stock back then was probably 10 bucks a share, and it's 100 bucks a share today. So I'm not afraid of regulation. What I'm more afraid of is this period of stasis, and kind of fits my theme. I'm short-term bearish. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think we're getting clarity. We're not getting a congressional bill in the fall. We're not getting clarity from the SEC or the CFTC in the fall. Um, it may take another president, uh, likely a Republican or, or a moderate Democrat. Uh, so we're going to be muddling through here, at least in the states, with some ambiguity. Are we going to get it right, though, Michael? Yeah, listen, over the long haul, we will. Um, right? I would say DeFi is going to win because it's a better product. Uh, right? It's composable, it's transparent, it settles atomically, like it's just a better product. And so you're going to, you're going to win in the long run. In the short run, there are people that don't want it to win. Um, right. And there's a lot of traditional people that are... Well, it's also, problem. listen, to, Tom said something, and you, you alluded to it, which is completely true. I remember standing in front of the Ethereal Conference in 2016, talking to this group of young crypto builders and saying, guys, you've got to self-regulate uh, or the regulators are going to come. And when you look at what happened over the last year, the, the industry did a horrific job self-regulating. Companies like Celsius ran monster leverage, taking consumer deposits, overnight deposits, and lending them three, four, five years with an asset liability mismatch that no rational guy would, would run. Uh, and I don't want to just pick on that. There are 15 companies like that, that, you know, if it wasn't illegal, it was stupid. Um, and listen, the SEC was in their offices. The regulators were in the offices of many of these companies. And they either didn't have the tools, didn't have the drive, didn't have the foresight. And so, like, I'm not giving the regulators a pass on this either. A lot of the crap that happened in this industry, which, you know, I think, listen, crypto was going to come down anyway this year because the Fed was hiking rates and liquidity was getting tighter. That last surge from 28,000 down to 18,000 was this excessive leverage that showed up in the industry and lots of players with zero transparency, right? It wasn't on-chain stuff. It was trade five players playing in uh, the crypto space. And in some cases, engaging in outright fraud. A hundred percent. And so, again, that's not good for the industry. It's not good for players in it. Uh, places like us that, you know, we have a lot of Wall Street experience and some savvy, we, we were able to navigate most of it. Um, but. Lots of retail people got hurt. Listen, but you know, the, the same mistakes, there are no new mistakes, basically, right? It's almost like if Bernie Madoff married John Merriweather, they had a baby called Three Arrows, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, right? We've, we, you've seen the movie before, Tom. You've goes, seen the movie. Goes back, goes back 100 years, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's part of, unfortunately, what led to the 33 Act and the 34 Act. Uh, right. So let, let's hope we don't see the pendulum swing that far with massive regulation come that comes in that kills innovation. All right, we're, we're, my last question is a short one. It's a trillion dollar marketplace right now. Uh, for you first, Tom, higher or lower in three years? Ooh, three years is 
is, uh, is the, perfect, it's the perfect time horizon for me. Um, higher, but, but not a ton higher. Five now, years. Ten, five years, much higher. We're at some point, we're going to hit an inflection point where it's like the dot-com bubble we had. You know, these companies we looked at, like Webvan, what a joke. The early video streaming, these things are ridiculous. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, they ultimately became yeah, they were just Netflix and Instacart. And Chewy it's coming. Pets.com, right? Right, exactly, exactly. So is that three years, is it five years, is it 10 years? I don't know. But the trillion is 100 trillion. I just don't know when we start seeing the block, the, the utility fill up the block higher space. Higher or lower, Michael? Three I, I think it's going to be higher. Uh, it better be higher. Or uh, there's a lot of crypto infrastructure that's been built, right? Companies like ours, we have 400 people. Like, most big companies that have big payrolls don't really work uh, if crypto's lower. I mean, so three years you'll survive, higher. you'll fire people, you'll, but the, the, for the industry to right. keep this momentum it has, and the momentum isn't just price, it's the unbelievable amount of talent. Mm -hmm. Like I looked at our 15 analysts and I couldn't get a job at my own damn company today uh, that just came in the door. Um, you know, there are, you, you take that team and you put them up against Goldman's best analyst or Google's best analyst. Like sure. the kids going into crypto now are world class uh, from all over the world. And so that's what's driving this. But if they don't get some return in then three to four years, they'll look somewhere else. And, and you'll, I noticed there's a private jet charter booth out there. You'll have fewer of those too. If it doesn't, if it doesn't kind of go up. <laughs> God, God forbid. We'll leave it on that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Novogratz and Tom Farley. Thank you guys very much. Thanks.